jointly with Joao, um, Eckhart Hein, and Benjamin Jungemann. Um, okay, so this is our outline of the presentation. We first will introduce the demand and growth regimes uh, and growth driver approaches. Um, then we will follow with the Sraffian super multiplier growth decomposition approach, which we understand as a bridge um, among the previously mentioned approaches. And after we will present our growth decomposition, uh, the application of these approaches to the BRICS countries before and after the 2007, 2009 crisis. And lastly, we will also mention some political economy insights of the autonomous demand uh, and uh, components and the Sraffian super multiplier approach. Um, we understand our paper as a contribution to the debate in post keynesian economics, comparative political economy, and international political economy and growth regimes and models. Uh, these demand and growth regimes in post keynesian economics derived first from a study of macroeconomic effects of financialization, uh, mostly in advanced capitalist economies made by Hein and Hammer, for example. And uh, the, particularly the national income and financial accounting based method uh, provide us with information regarding the sources of demand and growth or the lack of this also, and the financing of demand. Uh, in this method, four demand and growth regimes uh, were defined, uh, looking at the contributions of aggregate demand and the financial balances of the macroeconomic sectors. These are, we have like a two complementary demand uh, and growth regimes uh, that were export-led mercantilist and debt-led private demand boom. And then later, two intermediate regimes were also identified that are the weekly export led and domestic demand led. Um, so, growth regime shifts uh, following the 2007 2009 crisis were identified in several works of uh, Akchai and co authors, Hein and Hein and Marshin and Hein and co authors. Uh, advanced uh, export led mercantilist economies largely maintained the regime uh, after the crisis, but many European uh, developed private demand boom economies uh, became either export led or domestic demand led, stabilized by high public deficits. Uh, on the other hand, large emerging economies uh, showed a tendency to remain domestic demand led or even become the blade private uh, demand boom. What drives these shifts in previously the blade private demand boom economies, mostly in the European ones and advanced economies? Uh, well, these works uh, argue that private deleveraging plus the capacity or willingness uh, to run deficit uh, finance uh, stabilizing fiscal policies were the main reasons for these changes. Um, the national um, income and financial accounting approach that we are talking here uh, mostly only provides information on the demand sources of growth, uh, but not so much in the causal drivers of, of this. So uh, other studies follow uh, this approach that are, for example, the analysis of growth drivers that color and Hammer uh, did and also the macroeconomic policy regime of Heine and Marshall. Um, here, for example, in Colin and Hammer, uh, the growth drivers approach, they analyzed uh, 30 OCD countries pre and post crisis, and they find that uh, financial factors were strong, but also very cyclical uh, as a growth driver. Uh, on the other hand, expansionary fiscal policies became important post crisis. That this uh, is also similar to what was argued before. And price competitiveness has not been an important cross country driver, uh, according to this study. Um, Colin Stockhammer also uh, discarded the previous 
regime extinction for the post-crisis period because they uh, understand that it may generate misleading categories uh, when growth drivers change. Heinemann margin, uh, on the other hand, keep the regime typology and uh, undergone this uh, analysis of macroeconomic policy regimes where they analyze fiscal, monetary, wage policies, and also the conditions, uh, the external conditions of these economies. And they did this for Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And they relate this macroeconomic policy regime analysis with the um, trajectory of the demand and growth regimes. Here in our paper, uh, we are inspired by the work of Frida Sandweg, also uh, more recent works of Girardi and Porigoni and Morlin and co-authors. Uh, we try to establish a systematic link between this uh, approach of the national income financial accounting and the growth drivers or uh, macroeconomic policy regimes, because we think that uh, these are different levels of analysis that could be linked, uh, applying in, in our paper an autonomous demand growth perspective. I'm not gonna uh, say so much about uh, this because uh, already Ricardo talked about it, but uh, we uh, are based in the Srafian supermultiplier model where growth is driven by autonomous um, to current income um, non-capacity creating expenditures that here we represented by SIT. And this uh, expended autonomous expenditures were high public consumption, investment, a public investment, exports uh, and private consumption that is financed by credit and also household residential investment. These autonomous expenditures in those uh, private corporate investment, household consumption, out of current income and imports. Here in the first equation, we see the accounting, the composition of income and main demand aggregates that underlies uh, the national income and financial accounting approach that we previously present. And in the second one, we see the autonomous demand with its components. And lastly, in the third equation, we can see um, that the super multiplier alpha is defined by in terms of the induced components of demand by the propensity to consume, the propensity to invest of private firms, and the propensity to import. Um, we think that uh, also uh, based in, in, in Morlin and Coastals, we think that the uh, systematic analysis of these autonomous and induced components of demand uh, gives us the, the ground for political economy and economic policy analysis. Uh, and this is uh, important for what is we are going to present afterwards. This uh, analysis would be a middle ground uh, between national income and the financial accounting analysis and the growth drivers. So we are trying to link these this two approaches. Uh, as Ricardo already mentioned, it's an alternative to a more uh, supply side growth accounting. Uh, and we base our method also in Freitas and Dweck. Here uh, we have the, the main decomposition formula we applied where um, the five first terms or the, of the right hand side are the um, contributions of the autonomous expenditures of demand. The next three terms represent the contributions of the induced uh, components of demand. And lastly, last term is the contribution of inventory changes just to a uh, some uh, that the contribution some uh, unequal real GDP growth. We in, made, had to make some changes to the original methodology. We couldn't differentiate between state-owned companies' investment and private investment due to the lack of data for all the countries. And we also made an adaptation on the propensity to import or as, uh, compared to Freitas and Dweck. Uh, based on Gerard and Paragoni, uh, and also we, we took his methodology, their methodology uh, of consumer credit.
Sorry, I was having trouble to unmute myself um, while presenting. So I, I might have spoiled you a few slides forward. Uh, okay, so now that um, as one more presenter already, what we are proposing here, I think was already mentioned a lot by Professor Hein yesterday uh, of building this bridge between the national income and financial accounting approach uh, and growth drivers in the political economy analysis uh, with the use of the Serafian Supermultiple Partner Composition. And now I'm going to present to you how we, we did this empirically for the BRICS countries. Uh, so our exercise is composed by four steps. So first, of course, we do the National Income and Financial Accounting decomposition as done by the literature. Then uh, we do a decomposition with the super multiplier methodology distinguishing between autonomous demand and induced components. Um, uh, and then we look at the, the dynamics of this autonomous and induced components to explain the changes in regimes that were already observed by the, the first methodology. And lastly, uh, we do the bridge with political economy analysis and try to explain a little bit of this, these changes in the autonomous and induced uh, components um, by political economy matters of these countries. So first, why we chose the BRICS countries as they were first created. So without South Africa, uh, the BRICS are the four uh, major emerging economies. And they were as a group created in 2001. And when they were created or the idea of the BRICS was created, uh, it was that they were, would be countries that would be, let's say, uh, future economic powerhouses. Um, and in fact, as we can see by the graph of GDP growth, they did not only grew at high uh, growth rates, but also at, in general, accelerated growth rates from 2001 until the global financial crisis in 2007. Uh, so we're going to be looking at these four countries and we separate in two periods. So the first one coming, of course, from the beginning, from the formation of the term of the BRICS in 2001 until 2010, uh, because we understand that the crisis uh, that hit Brazil and Russia in 2009 also uh, is expressed in the growth rate of 2010 as a, a sort of rebound year. Okay, so first our results for the decomposition um, of all countries for the national income and financial accounting methodology. And we're gonna be focusing here only in two countries. So first Brazil and then China because of our lack in time. But then we're gonna first look at the change in the demand and growth regime of Brazil from domestic demand led to weekly export led. Uh, so when we, so this is the national income methodology and this is this reference super multiplier results. Uh, what you see there, the both uh, tables you're looking at right now are the same results. They are just organized differently in the left you have the differentiation between autonomous components and induced components. And on the right, you have the differentiation between the sectors. So we can see uh, by the super multiplier analysis that the change in domestic demand led to weekly export led did not come uh, from a fall in the contribution uh, of from an increase actually from the contribution of, of exports. Uh, actually, you have a fall in the contribution of exports from 1.5 to 0.6 percent of GDP, uh, but actually from a much greater fall in the in the domestic in the contribution of domestic sector, especially the public sector that contributed even negatively in the second period when compared to the first period. Uh, so this would indicate to us that what we first saw that the change of domestic demand led to weekly export led was actually due uh, to a fall in the public sector and not an increase in the external sector. Um, there's also many other things we, we could look at, but we're going to try to to be quick here. So uh, let's go to all the debates. First, also present um, the change in, in the demands in China. And I think also it's important to mention we chose Brazil and China between the four because uh, Brazil and China are rather different countries uh, that presented uh, very different um, trajectories after the crisis and, of course, have a much different structure of production with China being much more industrialized nowadays. So China changed from uh, export-led mercantilist to a weekly export-led from the first period to the second. Um, and, and then looking at the super multiplier methodology, just as we, we, we saw in Brazil, 
which is interesting in China case is that although exports were of course um, very influential uh, in both periods in the first period with a contribution of 4.8 percent which is quite relevant we see that um, the public sector was also very important in the growth uh, contribution of China already in the first uh, period. So the regime clustering of export-led mercantilists maybe uh, would not show this, but uh, the the rise in both uh, government consumption and investment uh, by the public sector is uh, was already very important in the first sec in the first period. But it, it was it maintained itself more in the second period when compared to to Brazil. Um, although exports also fall, also fell, and that would also indicate what we saw in the national uh, income decomposition, that the contribution, the general contribution of net exports, um, became um, negative and close to zero. This also has to do with the increase of the contribution of imports as an induced component, uh, which we'll see happen in all the four countries um, and most, I would say, developing countries in the period. Okay, so now uh, we briefly explain um, how the super multiplier uh, could give new insights to understanding the change, the shift in regimes. Uh, and now we come back to, to this um, same exercise to try to discuss some of the political economy of this uh, of these changes. And I think here is also important to mention that, um, as, as I said in the beginning, Brazil and China are two uh, very confronting cases because of the, the structures. And in a way, it, we could say Brazil and Russia uh, presented a much more similar uh, trajectory after the crisis when compared to India and China. So India and China still maintain high growth rates with an average of 6.5 in India and 7.3 in China. Um, and they they both did that by maintaining also the, uh, the, the expenditure in the public sectors, uh, while Russia and Brazil decreased a lot the expenditure in the public sectors uh, and also had a much lower growth rate in average growth rate in the second period. But at the same time, one could ask uh, oneself, right, uh, that also the structure of the, this two, this, this, this two groups of countries are very different. So Brazil and Russia are much more commodity dependent. So this could be uh, only a, a, a be only symbolizing the change in uh, in commodity prices uh, that would uh, uh, hit more Brazil and Russia. And in fact, we discussed this in the paper, when we look at the export uh, contribution of each country, so here we have the graph of Brazil and China, uh, so exports by, by product group as percentage of total exports, we see that they had different trajectories with Brazil becoming more dependent on raw materials and in commodities, especially an increase in exports of um, oil and still very dependent on agriculture, while China became more industrialized and exporting more consumer goods mainly. Uh, so the of course, this would affect more Brazil with, with, the, with the end of the commodity boom cycle. However, um, we observe that um, although this can be an effect, the exports fell proportionally very similarly in Brazil and China. So the contributions of, of export growth in, in both countries fell by 60%. Um, and on the same, so they fell by the same proportion. And in this, um, and imports in both countries actually uh, contributed positively, but also close to zero in the second period. I think it's interesting that this in a way shows that um, the, the external conditions were very affected by, by global trade. Uh, so the stagnation, the, the stag uh, stagnation policies that we have already discussed in this workshop uh, in the, the developed countries affected a lot exports 
and and trade overall. So in, imports contributed here positively because these countries were also importing less, probably because uh, there was less um, production and, and trade um, being pushed forward by, by the developed countries. And then we come back to what we have uh, discussed um, before that um, this pushes to the notion that maybe uh, the, the, the political economy dispute of uh, public expenditure uh, was very relevant in, in this change, in this shift uh, in, in regimes and in, in the growth trajectories. Uh, and then we, we cite in our paper the work of Nassif and co-authors that point out that um, Brazil and Russia are much more financialized and have less capital controls than India and China. So they, they had... Um, much less uh, protection to, to financial outflows and more uh, less um, space for expansionary policies uh, in the second period compared to in China. Another uh, exercise we do in, in the paper, which I think is interesting to mention here, although we don't have that much time, is uh, how distribution trends affect the the induced components of course distribution will affect uh, both consumption by households and um, imports. And it's interesting that in the first period when Brazil was domestic demand led, we can see there was an increase in the weight share and a decrease in the Gini coefficient. So, this, so income inequality was decreasing overall, uh, which, is, which is very aligned with the domestic uh, demand led that we, that we observe. But in the second period, Brazil is a, a bit more complicated uh, because wage share, uh, wage share increased until 2015 with, when, with the economy decelerating. Uh, and after the very new liberal reforms, you have a sharp decrease, you, you start having decrease in wage share, but the average of the wage share is, is, still, uh, is still increased. But that does not necessarily um, mean a, a decrease in, in income inequality as we see the Gini increased in the, in the period. While China is maybe a more clear case and, and a bit opposite. So when they were export that mercantilist, you, we can see there was a general um, deterioration of income distribution, which is very associated with um, export led policies in the literature. So we have a decrease in wage share and an in, in increase in income inequality by the increase of Gini coefficient. Although in the second period, and, and, and this might have a lot to do with the maintenance of high um, public uh, consumption and transfers, uh, although with less export orientation, so increasing its domestic market, we have a, an increase in the wage share and a general decrease in income inequality as represented by the Gini in the, in the second period, which I think is also in, in interesting insights that we can observe here uh, in our induced components. Okay, since we are running out of time, I'm gonna already jump uh, to our final considerations and conclusions. I think as we try to demonstrate here briefly with our political economy analysis and, and more throughout in our paper, I think the, the super multiplier methodology as a bridge, it can present very interesting insights in the dynamics of income distribution, uh, financial relations, external conditions and economic policies that uh, can be related to the macroeconomic policy regimes literature and to the to literature overall in uh, the money growth regimes in the relationship with uh, comparative political economy and international political economy. But of course, I think we have to be uh, very careful when we're doing this uh, political economy analysis, comparing countries broadly as uh, a good political economy analysis of a country, of course, uh, depends on the deeper comprehension of their institutions and their socioeconomic uh, formations and, and political disputes. So I think we, we here aggregate the debate already brought forward by Professor Hein yesterday and by Ricardo today. Uh, so we present, what we're doing here is actually uh, vowing for the compatibility between the methodologies and that as we have tried to show with our exercise, um, there are many interesting insights for comparative political economy and for post canadian economics that we can find by combining the methodologies of the national income and financial accounting and of the reference multiplier decomposition. Thank you very much and we are excited for the discussion.